Okay, so I'm going to show you how to pour a mould, how to cast a plaster mould. So we are using a liquid clay and we are going to be casting liquid clay, which we call slip, into the plaster mould to create ceramic shapes. The, the clay that we use is white earthenware, white earthenware slip. And before, before we do anything, before I start, I need to make sure that the slip that I'm using is the right consistency uh, and that's vitally important because if it's wrong then you're just wasting your time so you need to make sure that the the slip doesn't have too much water in because if it's too wet you'll get too much moisture too much water into the plaster of the molds which will make the molds take forever to set up and it'll also wear the detail in the molds out uh, but on the other side, you want to make sure that it has enough water because if it's too thick, you're not going to get the slip to go in to the very detailed parts of your of your moulds. It's important to get that right. So assume that I've checked my slip. I have, and I have some moulds out to show you, to show you some various things. The uh, this is a, a rhino and has an add-on, and I want to show you how we join pieces together when we cast. These two are uh, penguins and I want to show you why you have to move your flow of slip around when you're casting. I'm going to try and make uh, a fault, a hot spot, so you can make sure you don't get them when you're casting. Uh, I've also got an elf which is a three part mould and I've got a little caster ball that is a good size mould for you to start with. If you've never cast before, this is a perfect size mould for you to play around with at home. Uh, it's a good introduction into casting. So let's get casting. So if you look at the flow of the slip at the moment, you'll see it's coming out very slowly. And that's because I've just switched the tank on and it's only just started to mix and move around in the tank. Now, you could look at that and think, I need to add water to it to thin it down, to get it to flow a bit quicker. However, that would be the wrong thing to do because you're putting too much water into the slip. Now, uh, slip is thixotropic which means the, the more it moves, the more it gets mixed, the thinner it becomes. So if I'm just a bit patient and wait and let the mixer do its thing for a bit, you'll see the flow of the slip will start to increase. Thixotropic, if you think of uh, in the same way that a yoghurt is thixotropic. When you open the lid of a yoghurt, it's quite thick. Put a spoon in, mix it up, it thins down. Also, it's the reason you shake bottles of ketchup. It doesn't come out of the bottle, give it a shake and it blows up. Same with slip. So I'll just leave that to mix for a bit. Okay, we'll get pouring on the first of the, uh, the rhino. And as you can see, I'm moving the flow of the slip around just a little bit, just to make sure that we don't bombard the same part of the plaster mould. Just slowing down because it's just getting some top coming to fly out of the top. And there's that little bit there, that's his gear. Pull that up. Let's do the elf. Now, what I want to show you with these two penguins is, let's say this one I'm going to fill correctly, moving the slip around, and this one I'm not. I'm just going to pour it and I'm going to bombard the same spot inside, and we'll see if that makes a difference. Hopefully it will. So 
with this mod, I'm just holding the slip in one place and I'm bombarding the same spot inside the mold. Okay, so this mold, the final one, the little castable mold, uh, I'm going to turn the slip mixer off and pour it with a uh, a jug just to show you that you don't need all this equipment this pouring bench and a and a and a slip mixer to do casting you can do it at home with just slip and a jug and a bucket it'll it's absolutely fine it's just the scale makes production easier if you're doing lots of the same piece then it's it's justifiable to get a bench like this so this is a uh, a great little starter mold to play with. It's a little cat, dead simple, two-part mold. So it comes with a rubber strap, a rubber rubber band that holds it together. You can make these rubber bands actually if you get yourself an old uh, car inner tube and slice little um, bands off a car inner tube if you want to make some of those. Strap it together. And fill it up. So now we have all the all the molds filled with slip. We need to let the water from the slip absorb into the plaster of the mold. And as the water absorbs, you'll see the level of the slip will drop in each mold. Now, um, what's happening is the water is absorbing, and we're building up a, a thick film of well, a thin film of thick clay on the inside of each of these plaster molds and then after a certain amount of time we will tip them and remove the excess liquid clay from uh, inside of each piece and end up with hollow ceramic cast pieces now how long we leave each piece that varies and i would suggest the way that i like to judge when a piece is ready to to tip is to just look at it, to look at how much the level has dropped because that is, for me, the best indication of how much um, how much water is absorbed into the mould and therefore how thick the film on the inside of the mould will be. The problem with putting set times on different moulds is that it's going to be dependent on other factors um, like how damp the mold is, how many times you've cast this. If you've already cast this mold, for example, maybe three times in a day and you're casting it again for the fourth time, um, then it's going to take a lot longer to set up because of the, 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 the mold already has moisture inside the plaster um, a lot more than it did the first time you cast it when it was bone dry first thing in the morning. So it's going to take incrementally longer each time you cast it throughout the day for that slip to set before you can then tip it. But if you just keep an eye on the level of the slip, you'll see the level will go down and each mould, you'll get to know the, the size of the pore hole in relation to the amount of slip inside the mould uh, will uh, allow you to, to, to judge whether it is ready to tip or not. I know, for example, that this piece this rhino has quite small, two quite small pore holes because you'll see when I take it out, the, the, two, uh, the two feet of the rhino are relatively small, uh, yet the body of the rhino is quite large. So the pore holes have to be small, which means that the level will drop quite quickly in that piece. Uh, if you compare it with a penguin, which is quite a large piece, but the, the pore hole is quite large, so the level of this isn't going to drop as much. You can see already, for, uh, for example, this one, this, this, is, this has never been poured. I've just got this off the shelf to demonstrate to you today. So this is bone dry, um, and the level has dropped quite a bit on this one already. And honestly, I wouldn't be leaving this too much longer before I would tip it. Uh, another, thing, another factor to, to add is how thick you want the piece. Certain items you will want to cast and leave to develop a thicker film 
on the inside than other pieces. If you're making, uh, you know, a decorative ornament like this little cat, for example, he can be, he, she can be relatively thin. It doesn't matter. But if you've got a a jug, for example, a jug like this, you really don't want to have this thin. This needs to be quite thick because if it's too thin, it's going to be so delicate once it's cast. Uh, the as I said, the clay that we're working with is whiter than we're clay. So when it's fired, it's strong, but it's not super duper strong. It's not as strong as the higher temperature uh, clays that you can get. So we do need for the larger items, if you want a bit of durability, you do need to leave them a little bit longer to develop that thicker film on the inside uh, before you choose to tip them. Okay, so we'll just leave those for a bit and come back and tip them when they're ready. Okay, this little fella is ready to go. If we tip that, out comes the slip. I just want to check that the the head is empty. Don't want to get a solid head in there. And we'll leave that to drain. These other ones, not quite ready. If you look at the level of this mold, this elf, you can see that the slip has dropped almost to the bottom of the spare line. Uh, I know with this mold, actually, the slip can drop even below that spare line and it will still be fine. A way to just double check to see if that is exactly right will be, I don't know if you can see this, but it would be to cut the slip away, the dried slip at the top, and see how thick the, oh, I didn't mean to take it all off, how thick the layer of uh, thicker slip has become on the, the top of the spare line there. And that, I would say, is, is ideal. That's ready to tip. And this one, the penguin, that looks good too. I'd say that's ready to go. I could leave it a bit longer, but that's probably good enough. The level of this uh, rhino has dropped below the, the bottom of the spare line, which is, again, perfectly normal for this mold because it's got such a big reservoir of slip inside and quite a small pour hole, so that's fine. They're ready to tip. And the other penguin, that's good to go. So now that we've left this penguin a bit longer than the, the other one, this one will be thicker than its friend. But that's fine. So now all the moulds have been poured, they've been emptied, and now they're just waiting for the shape inside to be dry enough to be able to be taken out. And the, the bigger the mould, the longer that's going to take, the more water has to uh, come out of the piece inside the mould. But a, a piece like this, for example, you just feel it and that's plenty strong enough and dry enough to, to be demoulded now. So we can take that out. Um, the bigger ones though, we're going to have to leave maybe another, don't know, half an hour to an hour. This piece, we, uh, we cast this, this would have been probably about an hour ago I first put clay into it. So an hour after putting the, the slip in, it's now ready to, to come out. So this is the little kitten, the little cat that we cast earlier on. This is more than ready to come out now. It's a very dry mould to start with, so it didn't take very long at all for this to, to set. So this, uh, this tool is a plastic tool. We know it as a, a Lucy tool. I can't tell you why it's known as a Lucy tool. I have no idea. The, the idea of using a plastic tool is it's not going to, it's not going to damage the plaster of the mould. You don't want to really use anything um, anything like metal on a, on a plaster mold because it will just cut into the, the plaster and you end up with little bits of plaster in the clay. So 
I'm going to just use the, the, the tool just to get into the pore hole and just cut off the, the spare from the bottom of the piece. But the reason I use uh, a tool to do that is it just gives you a nice sharp edge to the bottom of the piece. You'll see what I mean when I take it out. Okay, so that's the spare. All this stuff, keep it. We can reconstitute that. Nothing wrong with that at all. Perfectly good to, to use again. So I take the strap off and ta-da! There's our super cute little cat. So, so, so simple to do. So easy to, to make. The reason I was cutting with the knife is that it gives us a nice sharp edge on the on the inside on the bottom of the piece there. So this is obviously still wet clay, damp clay, it's not that wet anymore. Um, we need to leave this to dry and as it dries that the the colour will lighten and then when it's dry it'll be nice and strong and we can remove the seam line from all around the the piece. Um, but we need to obviously leave that to dry first. What we could do now is we could put the mould back together and we can pour it again and if you had a few of these you could line them all up and you could start yourself a production line and create hordes of these beautiful little little pieces. Right, let's have a look at the elf. So we will just take the spare clay off the top there. Again, as I said, we'll keep all that. It's all perfectly good. We'll reclaim that. And then we'll take the spare off carefully without cutting into the plaster. And we lay that down. Unbuckle the strap. On a mould of this size, we use these banding straps which have these uh, very tight fitting buckles on them which are invaluable for big moulds because the pressure of the clay inside the mould, if it's insufficiently strapped, you get right near the top when you're filling it and then phew, it all just falls out the bottom. Um, so, laying it on its side. And the, the little tip with this is if the mould doesn't want to come apart, leave it. If it doesn't want to come apart, it's not ready to, 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 take, uh, to take the piece out. So give it a little wiggle and the piece of mould will come off. So I know it's ready. And there we are, there's Mr. Elf. So he's good, he's safe, he's done. So I need to just make sure I just take off these bits of clay from the inside of the mould before I put it back together. Just spend a bit of time just tidying up your mould um, before you put it away. So next time when you come to get the mould out, it's good to go. Oh, no, that way. That bit goes there. Okay, this is the penguin that I poured properly. We'll see if we can see difference between this and the other one. You can see as I try and lift that up it's still a bit wet. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to leave that, let him dry a bit and firm up a bit before I try taking him out. And that one too. They're both a little bit on the wet side. So we'll just leave those just to rest in the mould for a bit. 
and we'll come back to that. This is the Rhino. So this one's got a very small pore hole, so I'm not going to try and remove the the clay from the spare line. Uh, I'll leave that until I've got it out of the mold. Oh, need that. That's his ear. And again, that one's a little bit wet too, so I'm not going to rush it. I'll leave that for another 10 minutes and we'll come back and we'll have another go when it's a little bit drier. Right, that was maybe 10 minutes and we'll try that one again. Let's see if it's any firmer. That's better. If I took it out too early, it just wouldn't have the strength to hold itself up. I'm just going to remove the spare with a knife. And this part was his ear. So where you have an add-on, you need to get some slip that I I like to get some slip out of the tank earlier and early in the in the day and just let it congeal a bit so it's nice and thick. Uh, because then it doesn't run all over the place when you're trying to stick things together. So if it's a bit thicker, it's it's better. So a little bit of thick slip, stick that on there, and then give him an ear. Just go around with my finger just to make that seam disappear. And he's good to go. Right, the difference between the two penguins will be that one of them will have a hot spot on his head and down his back, whereas the other one where I kept the slip moving will be all clean all over. So it's less obvious when they're wet, it becomes a little bit more evident when they dry. So what I'm going to do with these two is I'm not going to bother to remove the seam line just for a, a test. I'm going to dry these two and then fire them and hopefully you will see the difference between moving the slip around in the mould and not moving the slip around in the mould. So there we are. There's our five masterpieces. Two penguins, an elf, a rhino and a pretty kitty. So we'll leave them all to dry. These will take maybe in a warm environment overnight and they'll be dry enough for you to, to remove the seam line. Once you've removed the seam line, you get greenware and at that point you can paint them, uh, but most often people will choose to then fire them to make them into bisque. Now the temperature you fire them at, that depends on the clay that you're using. The, the clay that we use um, is an Italian clay that we make ourselves into, uh, into a slip and the firing temperature for that to get to bisque is a cone 05 or around about 1020 degrees Celsius. These are the two penguins that I cast a couple of days ago and you can see this is the penguin where I moved the slip around and this looks fine there's no markings on this. Uh, if you look, compare it with this one very faintly you can see some markings just around here and one here where I poured the slip in and I didn't move it, I just held it in one spot. So this area has been bombarded with, with clay in one concentrated area. These are the penguins now fired to bisque. They both look pretty good actually, but this is, so this is the one that we move the slip around on and this is fine. This one is, is kind of okay, but if you look really closely, it's hard to see a bisque, but there is a, a hot spot apparent here, a very faint one and there's another hot spot here. 
I have just quickly glazed, dip glazed both of these penguins and you can see the difference between the two of them. This is the good one, the one that we've moved the slip around on. I've done it very roughly so there's a couple of runs on there but it's a nice even coverage all over. This, help, this one however it has the telltale signs of the two areas here that have repelled the glaze when, I, when it's been dipped. So here are our two penguins straight out of the kiln after the glaze firing. And if you look at this one, you can see that we have a nice, crisp, clean coverage of glaze with no blemishes or marks on the glaze at all. This one, however, has two dirty great brown marks on, on the side. This is a beautiful example of what a hot spot is. They're hard to spot in bisque. It was almost non-existent in the, in the white bisque before I glazed them. Very hard to detect. Yet after it's been glaze fired, you can clearly see the horrible dirty marks that we, we have here. These are classic horrible examples or very good examples of a horrible problem that you can have if you do not move the flow of the slip around in a mould. So that's what a hot spot is. Try and avoid it. It's very easy to avoid it simply by moving the slip around in the mould when you're casting. So I, so I will make a, another video on how to prepare the slip before you start casting. Um, I think it is vitally important that you have an understanding on how to get the slip into the best condition. Uh, it's, it's quite simple when you know how, um, but you need to understand the ratios of slip to water and how to make that adjustment. But if you do it once in the morning before you start casting, you will have a much more productive day and you'll throw fewer pieces away and you won't wear your moulds down nearly as much. Um, so I'll make that in another video. But uh, for now, thank you for watching and I hope you can see that actually casting is very simple. Um, you do need an area to do it in that you don't mind getting a little dirty. Uh, it will get a bit dusty. Uh, try and keep your work area as clean as you can, as dust free as you can if that's possible. Um, clothes like this are not particularly great for, for the dust because you will pick up the dust in, in the fabric. If you're going to be doing a lot of this, make sure it's a well ventilated area. A mask might be useful to have. Um, a plastic apron is a, is a good idea too because then the dust won't stick to you. Um, but just starting off with a very simple small mould is a great introduction and it will allow you to make such cute little pieces like this. Uh, and I would encourage you to do that. Many thanks for watching.